Uh, welcome to the Global Network webinar. My name is Yu Si Zhao, and uh, I will be monitoring this webinar today together with my colleagues Alex Chandler uh, Lotke and uh, Sean Lavo. And for those of you who are not so familiar with the Global Network of Data Officers and uh, Statisticians, this community is dedicated to improve collaboration and connections among statistical, economical, and uh, data-related professionals and organizations. And uh, as of today, we have more than uh, 2,400 members on the global network with uh, over 13 thematic groups. And we will also post our recording along with the presentation on the global network later today. And today is also our first global network webinar after a two month break. And we are thrilled to see you all again. And uh, during today's webinar, we are so happy to have Ms. Yong Yi Min. Ms. Hao Yi Chen and Ms. Heather Page from United Nations Statistics Division, and who will presenting some key findings of SD Report 2022 and its other assets, including SDG Progress Chart 2022, a new version of SD Human uh, Impact Stories, data stories behind the report, and the online SDG Extended Report. So SDG Report 2022 is one of the flagships in the UN DESA and was launched on the first day of the high-level political forum this year by the former Under Secretary General, Mr. Liu Zhenmin. And let me now tell you a bit more about our speaker. Ms. Yong Yimin is the Chief of uh, Statistics, uh, Sustainable Development Goal Monitoring Section in the Statistics Division of the UN uh, DESA. She is responsible for the program of the global monitoring of the progress towards the SDGs. She managed and uh, contributes to the work on the development and implementation of the global SDG indicator framework and supports the work of interagency and expert group on SDG indicators. She is the lead author of the annual global uh, the sustainable development report. Uh, goals report and manage other SDG monitoring output at a global level. Ms. Hao Yi Chen is a coordinator of intersectory working group on household service. Before she joined the current position in September 2019, she led the program on international migration statistics as a UN statistics division. She has also worked on various statistical areas, including gender statistics, population synthesis, civil registration, and vital statistics. She holds a PhD degree in statistics from the University of Florida. Lastly, uh, Ms. Heather Page is a statistician with the SDG monitoring section at UNSD. Previous to statistics, she was an environmental affairs officer with the Sustainable Development Natural Resources section of ECLAC. She has a dual master's from American University in International Affairs and the Sustainable Development Natural Resources. And a couple of uh, practical things. We will first hear the presentation of our speakers and then uh, have a Q&A session at the end. And please also feel free to write your comments and questions into the meeting chat anytime. And during the Q&A, please also ask a question yourself, or if you wish, we can also ask a question for you. So just let, uh, let us know. Uh, as always, this uh, webinar will be is being uh, reported and will be made available on the global network. And uh, we also invite you to continue the discussion on the global network after the webinar. Now I would like to pass the floor to our first speaker. Over to you, Yongyi. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Ishi. And uh, let me share my screen and uh, welcome, uh, colleagues, uh, to this uh, uh, webinar on the inside of the SDG reports, uh, 2022, and uh, behind the numbers. So I'm I'm glad to join my two colleagues, Howie and Heather, to present some of the key findings from the SDG uh, report 2022. Uh, in addition, we will also uh, present some additional SDG monitoring outputs, uh, which will assist the, the readers to dive deeper into the SDG data, trends, and the real life stories behind the, the numbers to help further understand the SDG progress. Uh, and just uh, um, before I start, I just also want to mention that Yu Xi uh, was also part of the reporting team and contributed to many of, of the outputs. 
Um, so the this uh, uh, webinar will uh, be divided into three parts, and uh, I will mainly cover the SDG report 2022 mean finding and the SDG progress chart 2022, and uh, how we uh, will focus on the data stories in the report, uh, uh, thinking behind the crisis and using the pandemic to advance high quality, timely, and inclusive data. And then uh, Heather will uh, touch upon some additional SDG monitoring output that we have, which is the extended report, the human impact story, a flipbook, and the SDG gender snapshot 2022, which uh, was just launched last week on Wednesday. So the, this annual uh, progress report is prepared by UNDESA in collaboration with the entire statistical system, uh, consisting of more than 50 international and regional agencies. So I would like to take this opportunity to thank uh, all our partner agencies for providing uh, valuable input and contributions uh, to the report and other outputs. Uh, so using the latest available data and estimates, the report shows the SDGs in grave jeopardy due to multiple cascading and intersecting crises with COVID, climate change, and conflict predominating. This in turn impact all the SDGs, uh, creating spin-off crises in food and nutrition, health, education, the environment, and the peace and security. This confluence of crises threatens not only the achievement of the SDGs, but literally our very own survival. So this report uh, paints a very sobering picture of how cascading crises are putting the SDG at risk. For instance, COVID-19, the impact of COVID-19 across the global are becoming clear with a very fragile recovery, and it's still far from over. Almost 15 million people have died directly or indirectly due to COVID-19 by the end of 2021. And in 2022, 75 million more people lived in extreme poverty than expected pri prior to the pandemic. 150 million more people faced hunger in 2021 than 2029. So impacts in health show a drop in immunization for the first time in 10 years and a rise in deaths from malaria and tuberculosis. So anxiety and depression increased by 25% uh, impact women and youth the most. And 24 million students from pre primary to university are at risk of never returning to school. Conflict are destroying the lives of many and the disabilize the world. The world is witnessing the largest number of violent conflicts since the World War II, with one quarter of the global population now living in conflict affected countries. Um, as of May this year, uh, a record of 100 million people has been forcibly displaced worldwide. The current Ukraine crisis is causing food, fuel, and fertilizer prices to skyrocket and fueling a threat of a global food crisis. Uh, due to the, the, the war and the continue of the pandemic, uh, the economic growth expected uh, to decrease a further um, point, 0.9 percentage point. Um, climate change, we are also in the grips of a climate crisis. So in order to starve off the worst impacts, the global greenhouse gas emissions will need to peak before 2025 and then decline by 43% by 2030, falling to net zero by 2050. But current national commitments do not meet this requirement. And in fact, 
point to a nearly 14% increase over the next decade. So other environmental findings show that in 2021, uh, estimated 17 million metric tons of plastic enter the ocean. And this number is expected to double or triple by 2040. So the world's most vulnerable countries and population group are disproportionately impact. So least developed countries struggle with weak economic growth, rising inflation, major supply chain disruption, um, policy uncertainty, and unsustainable debt. Uh, we also have alarming figures on how women and children are being hit hardest. Uh, child labor and uh, child mar marriage are on the rise. Young people continue to have a higher unemployment rates than before the pandemic. Women are also particularly impacted with lost jobs and livelihood, increased the burdens of care work at home, and some evidence also points to increased levels of domestic violence. And there is some positive trend from the report. For example, the number of internet uh, users surged um, by 782 million to reach 4.9 billion people in 2021 from 4.1 billion in 2019. And most in industries using media and high technology have already uh, returned to pre-pandemic production level. Uh, the report also points out to stay ahead of this crisis, we need to understand we, where we are and where we're headed. And that will require significant investment in our data and the information infrastructure. Without timely, high quality and disaggregate data, targeted policies, programs, and resources aims at protecting people during this most challenging time will inevitably fall short. Uh, later uh, in Howie's pre presentation, she will show you uh, that we still lack sufficient, timely, and disaggregated data in many areas. So investment in data and information infrastructure should be a priority of national governments and the international community. Um, so overall, the report underscores the severity and the magnitude of the challenges before us, which required uh, accelerate global skill action that is committed to and follow the SDG roadmap. Uh, again, I would like to emphasize the necessity of accelerated global skill action. It's important that we remember crises have a way of forcing new ways of thinking and open up new opportunities. For instance, COVID-19 response has speed up the adoption of digital technologies and led to embracing innovative approach. Um, while uh, risks and crises are uh, amplified when they're linked, so are the solutions. So when we take action to strengthen social protection system, improve public services, and invest in clean energy, we address the root cause of increasing inequality, environmental de degradation, and climate change. Uh, we know the solutions, and we have the roadmap of the SDG to guide us in weathering the storm and coming out stronger and better together. So uh, regarding the report itself, it's uh, uh, currently available in five languages and Ar Arabic uh, will come in soon. Um, the report uh, review uh, all the 17 goals uh, covering more than 100 in indicators using the latest data. Uh, this report includes 18 pages of infographics that uh, summarize key messages from all the goal chapter and also the leaving no one behind. And I also want to highlight again, uh, this is a great collaboration uh, across the entire UN uh, system uh, of, of more than 50 uh, international agencies. 
Um, behind this report, um, there are 2.3 million data points from country and territories. I would like to invite uh, um, people to explore the SDG global database. Um, so uh, in addition to the report, uh, and we also prepared uh, the SDG uh, progress chart uh, 2022. Um, many thanks to UC to work on this uh, uh, important product. Um, the progress chart uh, presents a snapshot of global and the regional progress of select target under the 17 goals. So the progress assessment is based on the most up-to-date data. And due to data collection challenges related to the pandemic, uh, uh, related to measures. Uh, so uh, measures of full impact of COVID-19 is limited uh, for some of the goals. Um, so the, the progress chart 2022 clearly demonstrated the deterioration of progress uh, towards many targets, uh, such as poverty, food security, ending the epidemic of malaria, immunization coverage, and employment. Uh, caused by the impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic, climate change, and conflicts. Um, recent Castilian crisis have, have magnified the challenge of achieving the SDG. So this is a glimpse of the progress chart. Uh, you can see the, the overall progress um, at global level and across the, the seven major regions level. So I just want to show you a, a quick comparison of some of the progress uh, charts from 2021 and 2022. From this chart, um, we, we know in 2021, when we uh, could assess the, the initial impact of the COVID-19 uh, on poverty um, and the hunger, and you can see uh, the orange part indicates uh, that uh, um, uh, the lack of progress or no progress, and red is means that the uh, it's a reverse progress. And from this, uh, the few the health uh, goals uh, such as um, reduce under five mortality, um, and increase the coverage of births attended by skilled health personnel and also ending uh, malaria and also increase the coverage. We can see significant uh, reverse uh, progress for all the health uh, areas. Um, so I will stop here. Uh, I don't know if we have time to play the video or we can we should continue with Howie's presentation. Hello, <clears throat> thank you. Thank you very much. I think we can have another uh, five minutes now for the video. For the video, yeah. So we the, have a, a video for the report, and uh, also have a, a seventeen video for all the uh, individual goals. So I will stop sharing, and uh, if you can share the the video screen, thank you.
Thank you very much, Yongyi, and uh, and this is all for the video. And now let me pass the floor to Ms. Hao Yi, and she will uh, be presenting some of the insight of the data story behind the report. Over to you, Hao Yi. Thank you. Rishi, can you see my screen? Oh, no, yet. Uh, yeah, I can see in, screen. It's in the. Uh, can you put it in the presentation mode? Oh yes. Sorry. How come I can't see myself? All right. Um. Thank you so much uh, for inviting me. And uh, first of all, I would really like to thank Yongyi and for including me as part of the process. And I really thoroughly enjoyed the, uh, the drafting and also working with the entire team. Many of you do not know how intensive the work was. Um, and then the team has been going through that many years. It's, it's really a rewarding process for me. Um, I am going, I actually am going, also going to thank all the data sources behind this. And there's a list of uh, source and the last slide from my presentation you all come to explore. So, uh, so what is the overall theme of of this year's data story and within the SDG report is really to uh, thinking beyond crisis. Um, what have we learned during the pandemic in terms of data and how do we use that experience to advance high quality, timely and inclusive data? So the the um, as you can see on the left chart that at the beginning of the pandemic, actually, in around May 2020, almost all national census offices have stopped face-to-face -face data collection. So many things have been impacted. All our lives have been impacted. And data, of course, is no exception. And, and as a household survey person who has been working as a survey in the past few years, and this is really heavily impacted. Things have changed a bit after that, you can see in the chart, but there are still many countries that uh, could not go back to face to face. And many of them had no experience uh, in remote data collection before the pandemic. So this had been really a struggle. So the pandemic really uh, overall picture that challenged the national statistical system. And it's really exposed the weak, already very weak statistical and IT foundation and made it even more obvious. And, and however, the pandemic also fostered innovation and collaboration among different players within the country and, and also across countries and at regional or global level. I uh, have raised many questions on inequality. Are we moving too fast? Are we really leave, are we leaving people behind with our, when we are embracing all the innovations? Um, so the data story really focused on what we have learned and how can we be ready for the next crisis? So the, all the data here, uh, the data source is uh, the SDG database. Thanks my, to my colleagues who have been responding to my midnight emails um, on data availability. I would also like to invite you to explore the data availability path, uh, dashboard over there. It's, it's been really fantastic to have that tool um, uh, to be used. And also a, a round of surveys that are Partners have been running together with us, including World Bank and Paris 21. So now a bit about the uh, SDG, global level SDG data availability and a very positive note, and there has been a lot of progress in terms of data availability. If you look at SDG uh, database, global database, you only have mentioned 2.3 million records. And in 2016, we only have 115 indicators. Now in 2022, we have 270 indicators in the database. However, there are challenges, um, as you can see in the chart uh, on the right, and uh, there are disparities among goals. And if you look, really look into each goals, and you will see many countries still struggle with filling the data gaps for, for many of the indicators. And we also see a lot, it's in the uh, data story in the SDG report, insufficient data disaggregation. They're showcased over there um, by sex, by age and sex, and also when we look at disability uh, indicators disaggregated by dis disability status, you will see a lot of data gaps over there. So are we really failing the leave, no, leaving no one behind a pledge to our people? Um, so what has COVID revealed it is really a wake-up call for a stronger statistical and ICT foundation. 
um, I show you the 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 countries that rush or weren't able to conduct face-to-face -face interview during COVID. And, and here, another really uh, shocking fact that we've seen when there is a technical advisor group uh, called by, led by WHO and UN Delta on excess COVID mortality, really to estimate the impact of COVID on mortality for countries and at the global level. And we quickly realized that that uh, only 38% of the countries in the world were able to provide the necessary data for that, uh, for the exercise, for the uh, estimation. Um, so it's it's really shocking and and it's it's really challenging to to truly understand the impact of COVID on mortality. On the other hand, if we look at ICT infrastructure, we all know how important ICT is when we're doing all the remote working. But many countries and national offices rely on ICT infrastructure for remote training for their surveys and censuses, and also for storing their data uh, uh, in the cloud. So uh, as shown here at the global level, uh, 62% uh, of the countries felt that they have sufficient infrastructure for remote training and 55 uh, for uh, uh, cloud computing services, but if we disaggregate by income group, you see a huge disparity there. Uh, positive notes, uh, COVID really helped pushing innovation. So uh, when, at the beginning of the COVID pandemic, there was in May 2020, when country was asked how, how are they going to use innovative approaches to measure the impact of COVID? and many really helpful phone surveys, web surveys, and you can also see uh, mobile phone data here, social media, remote sensing, satellite imagery, and also citizen generated data and crowdsourcing. And now we look back, um, really most of countries in the world have done at least one round of telephone survey to assess the impact of COVID on their economies and, and individuals. So innovation has been a really great uh, achievement, really a lot by, by, by the pandemic. Similarly for ICT infrastructure and in the survey that was carried out uh, in May 2021, a year after the first survey, and many globally, actually 58% of countries reported they have significantly improved their IT. Infra ICT infrastructure readiness in the last six months. But while we're really rushing, not rushing, really going for innovation, and, and COVID also served as a reminder for us to not leave anyone behind. We need to keep assessing uh, whether we are we were doing that or we really be careful with that. Um, and usually the uh, countries at a very vulnerable stage and also from the most vulnerable population groups are those when that are like so uh, according to this survey that in May 2021, and countries do report that they had difficulties collecting data on specific population groups, and the highest being at the global level migrants, 39% of the countries found migrants were not being covered well, and 27% uh, on older persons and 27% on persons with disabilities. And then you can see that also has a huge difference across income groups uh, across countries by income level. And ICT uh, or the digital divide was quoted as the most uh, significant contributing factor to this. And just think about the phone surveys we're carrying out in, in many countries, most countries. And if the phone penetration was only 50%, we're actually leaving out 50% of people uh, who are usually at the most vulnerable stage. Um, we've seen a lot of uh, partnership uh, at the country level. So COVID really served as a catalyst for partnership, uh, yet more needs to be done. Um, and for example, in Jamaica, the National Security Office has worked uh, very, very uh, quickly with health ministries to come up with data on, on health uh, uh, COVID during during the pandemic, and Kenya was also uh, able to collaborate with civil society organizations and managed to have citizen generated data uh, into their uh, national quality uh, data framework, quality data quality framework. So been countries are doing so, so well, uh, but they still feel there's not enough. Uh, so uh, if you look at the bottom bar, 
that 14, the darker gray, uh, darker purple always, and that the country felt that it was not a satisfactory, uh, that the, the partnership and coordination within the data ecosystem, national data ecosystem was not sufficient. And the lighter part means it has improved, but could be better. So globally, in uh, around all this September 2021, only 17% of countries found that their coordination within the country uh, in terms of data are good, satisfactory. So we've all seen during the pandemic, there are a lot of misinformation, disinformation, and communication on data has been so crucial. And then uh, in the survey, when asked about how they use, what kind of tool they use to communicate data with users, and you do see a, a difference actually from, from the uh, uh, high income countries and, and compared to the other countries. So there are more advanced or more modern, uh, like use of social media and more focused, targeted communication, tailored for specific population groups, seem to be uh, e-learning, podcast, live chat sessions need to be more adopted in high income countries and, and uh, for low and lower middle income countries, they tend to use more traditional ways of communication. So we do see a disparity on this. Now my last slide, uh, going back to thinking beyond crisis, what have we learned? We have learned that ha there has been a lot of innovation, a lot of data gaps being reviewed and countries were so capable and so fast in adapting to the situation moving forward. And, but it's not enough. And how do we be, how can we be more prepared if there's another crisis coming up? Um, so we've learned a lot, we've documented a lot, and we're still trying to push that uh, for, for further innovation and, and to be ready for the next crisis. However, if you look at um, how the, the, the resources available during COVID, 40% uh, of the country reported that data collection costs has gone up. Yet 48% of the countries reported that the funding has been cut down during the same period for data. So how do we really get the sufficient support from the government and from other uh, donors, other uh, sources to really support our countries to move forward from now to be ready for the next pandemic. Um, now, last slide, uh, resources, as I promised, thanks to our colleagues who have been working uh, tirelessly on the SDG indicated database and the four runs of UNSD and, and the World Bank survey with countries national school offices, and then uh, I ran a uh, survey on the implementation of the Cape Town Global Action Plan for SDG Sustainable Development Data, which was carried out by UNSD, uh, the World Bank, and Paris 21. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Hao Yichen. And um, I also believe uh, timely and accurate data is always needed for not only monitoring the SDG progress, but also for other responses and measures towards the current cascading crisis. And thank you for presenting all these facts and the challenges behind the data collection and the data availability. And now I would like to uh, give the floor to our last speaker, Ms. Heather Page, who will be uh, introducing us the um, uh, newly launched report called Gender Snapshot 2022, and also the uh, um, the the as you report the other assets. Over to you, Heather. Thank you so much. Uh, let me just sorry skip to my section. <laughs> uh, thank you so much for the opportunity. Uh, my name is Heather Page. I'm part of uh, Young Yi's team, um, working on the SDG report and other outputs. And so I just want to um, just have a couple minutes to talk about some of the other. Uh, products that come out um, from the SDG report uh, that allow um, a deeper exploration of the data and storylines and context around uh, the SDG indicators. So what I'll start with is our extended report. Uh, we are, This is our second year to provide an extended report. We are um, luckily receive um, very extensive storylines um, and charts and information on each of the indicators from our custodian agencies or the custodian agencies for the SDG indicators. And while the global report is 
kind of short and concise and really trying to cover um, uh, the most up-to-date data. And uh, there is still information that, that is left out just due to basic space constraints. And so we provide the extended report um, as an opportunity to look at all the indicator um, inputs that we've received. And so these are the storylines um, with data and charts uh, from all of the custodians that cover all of the goals um, and all of the indicators. And it's additional context and, and even some additional data and charts. Um, and it's really a great resource if you want a deep dive or if you have a very specific question about a very specific um, indicator, this is really where um, we would also recommend that you go. Um, and in addition, there are additional links and resources that um, custodian agencies can point you to related to the indicators. So um, this is our extended report also on our website um, where you can. Um, next, uh, this is our first year to produce um, what uh, turned into um, bringing data to life. Um, it's SDG human impact stories from across the globe. Um, and this prod uh, project was, um, uh, the impetus for this was that a lot of times the global numbers and the global figures um, can be a little bit abstract and a bit difficult to really understand what does that look like on the ground? What does that look like for people that are literally kind of living the SDGs? And so we partnered with the uh, UN information centers from around the world, as well as UN um, agencies and organizations to create um, what we've uh, de uh, developed as a flip book uh, so that it has an interactive feature. And this flipbook actually, it, it's a collection um, and showcases the faces and stories kind of behind the data. And there's 37 real life stories uh, from across 24 countries. And it ranges from, you know, people that are struggling to get out of poverty, battling the effects of climate change in their daily lives, dealing with the impacts of COVID-19, among other challenges. Um, and we uh, organized this document um, by goal, but what was so striking about each of the stories is that you can see the interconnectedness of the SDGs very much front and center in each of the stories. And you can see how interventions in one area can absolutely trickle and impact other areas. Um, and uh, just how important it is to really try to be multifaceted in our approach. Um, and I really strongly recommend, um, if you can, to please give it give it a glance, give it a check it out, because the stories um, are including. We have stories in here as far, as well as videos, so it has an interactive feature. And these stories will really take you around the world. We have, for example, climate change on the coast of Chile, a man's quest to help girls access their right to health and hygiene in Indonesia getting kids back to school following COVID-19 closures, literally going door to door in Brazil, helping gain access to electricity among 17,000 Indonesian um, islands, and then ambassadors of the sea in Costa Rica, just as kind of a, a quick glimpse of some of these stories. And each of the stories also includes a link to the original story, um, also uh, sometimes in uh, different languages, as well as some videos that you um, can check out. So we're really excited about this document and we um, and this collaboration, and we, we hope to have more of this so that um, we can really kind of remember the point of the SDGs is really to like help our, our fellow you know, persons, our, our fellow neighbors um, around the world uh, in, in all of the different ways that, that uh, the SDGs cover. So um, my last uh, uh, slide will be on the gender snapshot. As Young Yi mentioned, this was launched just last Wednesday. This is the fourth edition of the gender snapshot. Uh, it's a collaboration with UN Women and also uh, DESA or UNSD. And it presents the latest evidence on gender equality across all 17 goals, um, really calling out the long road ahead um, in order to achieve gender equality. And so the new report, just to give you a glimpse of, of what you would find is, as you explore this report, um, it highlights that you know, at the current pace of progress, SDG 5 uh, will not be met by 2030. Um, and in fact, uh, we're still centuries away. Um, at the current rate of progress, the report estimates that it will take up to 286 years 
to close gaps in legal protection and remove discriminatory laws, 140 years for women to be represented equally in positions of power and leadership in the workplace, and at least 40 years to achieve equal representation and national parliaments um, and to eradicate child marriage by 2030. Uh, the report estimates that progress must be 17 times faster than the progress of the last decade. And with girls from the poorest rural households and in conflict affected areas expected to suffer the most. Um, and other uh, other figures in the in the uh, document uh, today, over 1.2 billion women and girls of reproductive age live in countries and areas with some restrictions on access to safe abortion. Um, and we're seeing a backlash against women's sexual and reproductive health and rights, uh, which are further exacerbating gender disparities. In addition, there's a re worrisome reversal on the reduction of poverty and rising prices are likely to exacerbate this. Um, by the end of 2022, around 383 million women and girls will live in extreme poverty compared to 368 million men and boys. Um, and many more will have insufficient income uh, to meet basic needs. So one of the other uh, tenets of the report is that moving forward, progress on SDG 5 will remain out of reach unless long-term structural barriers to gender equality including discriminatory norms, laws, and practices are addressed and dismantled. Um, and nearly at the halfway mark, the time to act and invest in women and girls um, is now. Um, and global cooperation and investments in gender equality and the women's empowerment agenda um, are essential to right the course and put SDG 5 uh, back on track. So um, I invite you to please also check out the gender snapshot. I know we have quite a few things on our website that. Um, we'd love for you to explore. So this is just um, a sample of, of, uh, of the main ones. And so I'll just uh, end with um, kind of our quote from the, the SG about uh, rescuing the SDGs and really trying to write the course um, from where we're headed so far um, uh, from all of the, the different uh, findings from these reports. So thank you so much. Thank you so much, Heather. And I think this is really helpful. And uh, uh, earlier of this webinar, I also posted a link to the IC Report website where you can find all of those assets and as well as IC Report 2022 in the website. And now um, we can, I have already turned on the privilege of uh, turn, turning on the video and the microphone of all of those uh, attendees. And uh, now we are moving to our Q&A session. So let me just read through the chat because I, I can see that during the presentation, almost uh, uh, all question has been answered. And uh, I can only see the first question, which asked by the uh, Matt Hyben Helen, uh, who asked about um, any particular focus for the upcoming leadership summit in UNGA as per the S SDG perspective. Um, I'm not sure if anyone want to answer this question from the panel. Um, I'm sorry that we're, we're not involved in that uh, leadership summit, so we don't have much information on that. Thank you. Thank you, Yi. And uh, also I see most of question has been answered um, in the uh, chat. Yishie, maybe I can elaborate mm. uh, on a few yeah, of the, the questions asked uh, and, uh, from Gula on, on the two questions and, and also some follow up question mm. by some uh, participant on the, the data, uh, where the data from. The data is provided by uh, which, which we call the custodian uh, in, uh, agencies. So each indicator we have a custodian agency or agencies that um, uh, collect the data from the country and ensure the, the global comparability uh, of the data. And uh, so we have this annual uh, a uh, cycle of data uh, submission by custodial agency. So, uh, in the UN SDG Global Database, we updated the data quarterly, but not all data are updated quarterly. So, we uh, there is a certain indicator that available a certain type, of, but majority data um, uh, available in March and also in July when the report is launched. Um, the I think some. Uh, um, 
uh, colleague asked about the question of the, the uh, data from the country or the from government. Uh, the, uh, there's a guidelines on um, how the custodian agency can collect the data um, and um, all validate the data um, with the, the country. So uh, in um, there's a couple round of, uh, in the IG report, um, the, the, the particular criteria for how to implement uh, these guidelines. Uh, uh, for example, the custodial agency uh, should, when they send a, a data collection request or data validation request, uh, they need to uh, give the country uh, about uh, uh, four weeks of time uh, to review and validate and if there is a, a discrepancy uh, between the data uh, estimated or modeled or, or adjusted by the custodian agency, um, the custodian agency has a responsibility uh, to work together uh, with the country uh, to resolve this discrepancy. And if, of course, there's maybe some outdated data that uh, um, uh, the, the country either didn't provide or because of the data, um, um, is uh, uh, being uh, provided by different like um, uh, ministry other than the National Statistics Office uh, that's not uh, taken into account in the global database. So if uh, the country find out that the, the data is outdated in the in our database, uh, we'll encourage, encourage you contact the, the custody agency. On our website, we have a list of the focal points for every single indicator. So if anything happens, um, you, you see discrepancy, you see uh, the data outdated, we, we encourage you to contact the custody agency to get the, the data updated. And so this is the one question I think I want to elaborate a little more. And the, my second uh, thing I want to elaborate is on the uh, the SAD, SDSN index. I just want to re-emphasize the uh, SADS SN index uh, has great value, but it's not official UN report. Although um, I, I think their their report is a little confusing. They have very similar name uh, as our report. Um, they offer very good uh, compl complementary information. Um, and uh, um, uh, however, I just want to maybe. Uh, uh, add a little bit caution and um, one because they use a, a composite index. Um, so um, using and interpreting a composite index uh, sh sh uh, need to um, have some caution. Basically, index are, uh, are very useful as an advocacy tool and as they enable ranking and attract uh, attention. And however, when trying to an analyze the particular shortcomings uh, or op operationalize intervention in a particular field, it's difficult to pinpoint opportunity errors. Uh, sometimes the ranking um, can incentivize the countries to promote short-term policies, which lack long-term soundness to improve a country's position in the ranking. So this is a, um, maybe some caution I want to add. Thank you. Thank you, Yi, for all of those elaboration. I think that's really be helpful for um, those questions. And uh, I also see that uh, Daniel has posted the list of data of uh, data focal point for the IC reports uh, in the chat. So please feel free to check out. And um, so I can see that there's an additional question uh, asked by uh, Marinda, and uh, she asked about, would you please tell us more about the bringing data to life documents? Why was this the first time something like this has been Produced and what is the UN doing to promote this storytelling style of print, uh, presenting data? Thank you. Uh, do you want me to take that one, Yanni? I'm assuming you can. Go ahead. <laughs> okay. um, so uh, we also so the bringing data to life document. Um, uh, was kind of our hope for what we could what we could actually get. Um, uh, it's it's hard to get these uh, 
local level stories, especially from around the world. So we really had to collaborate with the UN um, kind of information centers um, who also coordinated with other UN agencies and organizations um, in their areas, kind of in their regions and local areas. And so um, we kind of put, we, we coordinated with the uh, Department of Global Communications to, to work with the UNICS on trying to get as many stories as we could. Um, now these are, are not so, so data heavy, so, so data specific um, as far as what they really do is really illustrate the types of situations that people are in, which the SDGs are trying to address. Um, and so that is what we mean by they are kind of the faces and the stories behind the big global pic picture, big global numbers that you would would read about, for instance, reducing poverty by, you know, X percent. What does that really mean to someone who's facing um, this on a day to day basis? And so we were lucky enough to receive quite a few submissions from the Unix um, and had to really kind of uh, condense uh, the information into something that could be interactive um, and also um, representative uh, as much as possible um, around the world. And so uh, for us, this was the first time uh, to produce this. Um, a lot of the stories that were provided to us were actually stories that Unix and other organizations have already put out, um, or they have compilations of things that, in particular, that um, ways that were the uh, areas were addressing COVID um, and things like that. So they've definitely put out this information, but this was a way to bring it kind of together and package it um, to really kind of connect it to the SDGs. Um, and so we're hoping to start to promote this um, and also uh, continue this type of work. But we also really all do want to focus on very, you know, data specific stories. Um, and we do also want to make sure that we're, um, you know, showing also how important the data and information infrastructure can be for also achieving the SDGs. So we'll We'll try to work with the Unix in the future um, on that as well. I hope that answered your question. Thank you. Thank you so much, Heather. I think that's a pretty comprehensive answer for, for this question. And uh, so far, I don't see any further question being asked in the chat. And uh, uh, I, I encourage you to ask any other qu questions if you have, and you can raise your hand. And I can see this one hand being raised. Uh, Man, heaven, please go ahead. You can unmute yourself and go ahead. Thank. Uh, am I audible? Am I audible? Thank you. Uh, it's great being here. Actually, uh, it was wonderful seeing the report. The first chance at the daily briefing. Uh, it it was splendid actually. Uh, I just wanted to understand, uh, given I'm a researcher in AI, artificial intelligence, I, uh, is there any sort of AI or a machine learning algorithm being used which is uh, to create these reports on SDG? Uh, or do you refer or recommend uh, to the general community? Thank you. Man, maybe I'll take on the question. So we're we're uh, not directly aware that uh, the the AI uh, uh, machine learning has been, but I'm pretty sure when the custodian agency when they collect the data because we have a uh, um, 231 data, and uh, many of the the uh, particular the new indicators. Uh, and use a lot of the uh, updated uh, like um, technology, uh, like uh, geospatial information technology and other technologies. Um, so we'll, oh, possibly in some of the indicators, uh, um, uh, machine learning and AI has been used, but uh, we're, we're not uh, directly aware uh, of any particular indicator um, that use uh, that. Thank you. Thank you Yi, for answering that question. And uh, I don't see any other hand being raised uh, at the point. And also I believe all of the question has been answered in the chat and also has been elaborated by my colleagues. And thank you so much for that. So with that, I guess we can uh, conclude our uh, the World Network webinar. And uh, before we close our meeting, I just want to encourage everyone to turn on your camera and also turn on your microphone.
to give us uh, a round of applause. Thank you, and uh, thank you for our speakers for the presentation. Thank you. Okay. So now I'm going to stop the recording. <laughs>